Hello! In this episode we will take a look inside a car stereo and I will tell you one or two things on how it works. The main purpose of the video is to show you how you can mod old car stereos like this one to attach your smartphone or mp3 player. The idea is very similar to what I have shown you in my video Old Radios as Smartphone Docking Stations. Many fundamental ideas that I explained in that video can be applied to this project as well. We are sitting inside a 1996 Opel Corsa B, also known as the Vauxhall Corsa in the United Kingdom and most probably not at all known in the US and Canada. The car is equipped with a typical mid-1990s car stereo. It has of course no built-in MP3 player and not even a CD drive. And we will not change that fact. But since virtually all of you are already carrying an MP3 player, smartphone or other smart device around, wouldn't it be great if you could simply attach that player to the radio? Well, there are already some technical solutions for that. Like these little transmitters you can attach to your phone or these cassette adapters that you can simply plug into the cassette drive. I own both of these devices and I was always very disappointed with them. The cassette adapter delivers very poor music quality, while the transmitter is simply too weak to deliver a noise-free signal to the receiver. More powerful transmitters can be imported from Asia, but are actually illegal in many countries. Furthermore, external transmitters often need batteries or must be connected to the car battery. From an engineering standpoint, it would be much smarter if there simply was an auxiliary input jack on the front panel of the unit by which the signal could be fed directly into the amplifier. With this unit I removed the cassette drive, which I will never use anyway, and added exactly such an input jack. But enough talk, let me show you how it's done. If you want to take your stereo out of your car to take a look inside, you first have to bypass several safety features. If your stereo is secured by a code, you first should deactivate that feature. I will not show you how that is done, since it will be a bit different with each model. If you buy an old unit on eBay, always ask for the code, or the stereo might be completely useless to you. After deactivating the code feature, I unscrew the Allen screws in the four corners of the front panel. At least in this car, you can now not simply pull the stereo out of the slot, but you actually need a pair of special levers for that. But I don't have these levers. But being the gangster that I am, I do it the ghetto way with four old nails. Here you see the car stereo in its original condition. It is a Blaupunkt Car 300D 4-channel car stereo. It has a weird looking multi-pin connector on its back side. Luckily, the pin out of that connector is printed on a label on the bottom of the enclosure. This however is not the case with every car stereo. There is a chance you will have to look it up online. Okay. So, after opening the enclosure by simply lifting off the top and bottom metal sheet, we can get our first glimpse inside the device. Placed over the main PCB, we see the cassette drive, which we will remove from the unit. But it would be no good idea to simply pull out the drive. We have to figure out in which way the cassette player is communicating with the rest of the circuitry. For that, I will now place a cassette into the drive. In order to test the unit, I connected the car stereo to a lab power supply and a loudspeaker. By the way, that is not my taste of music. The drive is connected to the rest of the circuitry by 9 wires. Two wires power the cassette drive's DC motor. Another three are the signal wires coming from the DEX electromagnetic reader head. Another two pairs of wires are connected to little switches which are mechanically activated when a cassette is placed in the drive. This first switch is moved when a cassette slides into the drive. The second switch is activated when the cassette starts playing. We will have to measure if the switches close or open when being activated. You do this with a multimeters continuity tester. The 
result is that both contacts must be electrically closed to tell the audio controller that the tape drive is running. We will later trick that controller by adding a two rail switch to the front panel with which we will simulate a cassette being pushed into the drive. Now that we know what is going on here, we can remove the entire tape drive unit. This gives us free sight on the PCB beneath. What I have done next is to read off the part numbers of the various integrated circuits inside the device to get an overview over what is happening here. On the left hand side we have a TDA7372A. It is a 4 channel class AB power amplifier chip. It is mounted to the enclosure which it uses as a heatsink. The four equally sized electrolytic capacitors are the output capacitors of the power amp. They are needed to deliver negative voltages to the loudspeakers, when, like in this case, only a single rail power supply, namely the car battery, is available. The strain on these capacitors is relatively big. Should you ever try to repair a power amp, you should check those. Near the power amp we find a TDA 7348D, which is a digital audio processor. It creates four separate audio channels from the two stereo input channels coming from the radio receiver or the cassette drive. It does that by a MOSFET based multiplexer. I'm not sure if the processor really adds any new information to the newly created channels. I guess the main purpose is to enable the user to control the volume of all four channels separately by the potentiometers on the front panel. The balance, volume and tone potentiometers are down here and they are connected to the processor. The parts up here seem to comprise an input filter for the entire device. A big relay which switches the stereo on and off can be seen too. In the bottom right corner a tiny chip can be found. It is an MC33078 dual operational amplifier. It is connected to the rear head of the tape drive and to the inputs of the audio processor. It is pretty clear that it serves as a pre-amplifier stage for the very small voltage that is generated by the reader head when the magnetic tape moves across it. The entire upper section of the PCB is the radio receiver circuit. You can recognize that by the air core inductors and shielded filters. The part numbers of the numerous integrated circuits in that corner of the PCB only confirm that. The upper section inside the metal shielding is the FM circuitry for 87.5 to 108 MHz, while the RF circuitry outside the metal cage appears to be the AM receiver, which works with much lower frequencies. Furthermore, we find an integrated linear voltage regulator L4949N. It most certainly generates the 5 volt supply voltage for the digital circuitry. Down here you can find some 74 logic. The remaining chips, whose part numbers didn't deliver any useful information, surely comprise digital circuitry which handles the RDS system, the security features and other functions. The crystal oscillators make it very probable though that they are microcontrollers. Now, as you can see, there is actually quite a lot going on inside even an older car stereo like this one. One of the most important skills for hacking electronics equipment though is being able to separate a complex system like this into several functional blocks as we have done just now. Since the subsystems of this device act widely independent we will be able to reach our goal by simply concentrating on the audio circuitry while leaving the receiver circuit and the digital circuitry aside. To explain to you why I will now modify the device in the way I'm planning to, I made a little drawing. But please be clear about one thing. This is not an actual circuit diagram, but simply a rough functional diagram that is supposed to show how the car stereo works on an abstract level. Since I couldn't get the schematic for this device, my information is based on my experiments and some manual reverse engineering. The supply voltage from the car battery enters the input filter and relay stage and is then distributed to the separate parts of the circuitry. The digital circuitry is supplied via an additional plus 5 linear regulator. The power amplifier, the receiver circuit and the reader heads preamplifier are also independent parts of the circuit 
which are likewise supplied via the input filter. Finally, the audio processor connects all the audio devices with one another. An electronic selector switch that is controlled by the state of the two switches, one and two, determines if the input signal is derived from the receiver circuit or from the reader heads, while that signal is not connected directly to the processor IC, but is first amplified in a separate preamplifier. A multiplexer and preamplifier circuit inside the audio processor chip allow that the input signals from one of the two sources can be applied to the input of the power amp, which finally drives the loudspeakers. The volume, tone and balance control potentiometers are connected to the control circuitry inside the audio processor. To attach external sound sources like smartphones or MP3 players, I will now do the following modification. An external stereo input jack is soldered to the input pins of the audio processor. The traces which lead from the reader heads pre-amplifier to the audio processor are deleted. The reader heads are also disconnected because they are installed inside the cassette drive which I want to get rid of. The inputs of that preamp are then connected to ground to avoid unwanted oscillations of that amplifier. You could also delete this amp entirely, but I want to keep the modifications as minimal as possible. Furthermore, the switches 1 and 2, which were installed inside the tape drive, will be exchanged against external switches on the front panel, with which we can trick the unit into thinking that a cassette was just put inside the cassette drive, so that the signal coming from the MP3 player will be routed via the selector switch into the amplifier. In addition, we will replace the tape driver's motor by a small resistor. Now, all that is left for me is basically to do in real life what I just explained to you in theory. First, I remove all the old signal wires coming from the reader heads. Then, I connect the preamp's input pins to ground with a simple piece of wire. Now, I remove the wire which connected the DC motor with the board. After that, I connect the two solder pads with a 1 kilo ohms resistor. The resistor acts as a dummy load. It is simple precaution. My experience teaches me that it is never a good idea to simply remove a load and put nothing in its place. In this way, you can often avoid unstable behavior of an unknown circuit. If I had the schematic, I probably could tell you for sure if this is even necessary here. Now it is time to disconnect the preamplifier's output from the audio processor. Here are the traces leading from the op amp to the processor's inputs. I decided to cut them here. I simply cut the traces and scrape the copper off. I didn't do a good job here. There are sure better ways of doing this. After that, I use the continuity tester of the multimeter to check if the traces are truly deleted. Now I want to solder the new input signal wires that will be connected to the external MP3 player to the PCB. For that, I have to scrape off some silk screen over this piece of ground plane to connect it with the ground of the wire. And of course, I have to solder the actual signal wires to the input of the audio processor. With that being done, it is time to test if the input signal has the right voltage and is properly amplified. For this, I have again connected the car stereo to a lab power supply and a loudspeaker. I also had already connected a temporary external switch so that the processor will route the input signal through. The signal is coming from my computer's sound card, playing an mp3 file. <laughs> What remains to be done now is to install an input jack and the external switch on the front panel. For that I use a salvaged two rail switch which can replace both internal switches at once. A salvaged 3.5 mm input jack and a piece of scrap aluminium. I first drill two holes in the aluminium sheet. Now I cut it to the right size with an angle grinder.
and after preparing the surfaces of the front panel and the sheet with some sandpaper and mounting the switch and the jack, I glue both parts together with cyanoacrylate. After having waited 20 minutes or so for the glue to harden, I finally solder the switch and the jack in place. And all that remains to be done is to put the enclosure together again. So I hope that you like this idea and that some of you can apply some of this knowledge for your own projects. If you like this video, subscribe and please check out my new second YouTube channel, the Post-Apocalyptic Archive.